Holy Spirit, we pray that you might grant us your uh, your virtues and as well as your fruits, that we might um, grow in wisdom and in piety, that we might be able to more effectively access your wisdom and use your wisdom when um, when witnessing our faith in our daily lives. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so uh, for those of you who were not here last week, um, we we did we did we did have class. Uh, we had maybe a similar turnout to what we had uh, what we have today, and we talked about the Crusades. Anyone who was not here last week but wants to see that Rich actually, uh, Rich Olin actually taped it. He's going to put it on the on the church uh, website. Cool. So you can go and see the talk. I I, didn't, I haven't seen it myself, so I don't know what the quality is, but there there are recording back there. So, that was on tape too. Okay. <laughs> You've never taped Mr. Schwartz. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so um, so let's talk about the Crusades, and uh, this week we'll be talking about the Trial of Galileo, which is probably the, if I had to pick the three most oft uh, misunderstood parts of church history that people cite in apologetics work, it's the Inquisition, the Crusades, and Galileo. And this is leading up to uh, Papal Infallibility Part 1, which we're going to do next week. If, we, if I finish early with Galileo today, then I'll start by doing a little bit of papal infallibility because the Galileo thing is often brought up in papal infallibility, um, debates on papal infallibility. So next to the goal for, uh, so next week um, we'll talk about the philosophy of the doctrine of papal infallibility and where it comes from, and then we'll talk about sort of the scriptural basis of papal infallibility. If we finish Galileo early this week, um, then I'll start talking about the philosophy of the doctrine and how it can be understood. But, um, so just to see you now, let's see, the, um, where am I getting the information for the Galileo talk? Two places. One, really good book that I have here by uh, Dr. Jerome J. Langford, Galileo of Science in the Church. This guy actually uh, teaches um, history at Christendom College. Um, so I have his book here. Anyone is interested, and he gives a detailed analysis of the uh, um, scientific theory as understood in the 16, 15, and 1600s, and sort of the anatomy of the controversy. Also, um, you can also act. You can also. It's kind of fun. You um, the, as I mentioned in the Inquisition thing, in, in the Inquisition talk, the Inquisition kept really good records. So um, actually, all of the documents of the Galileo trial you can actually find online at various websites. So um, the other source that I'll be using for this talk is the actual trial documents the Inquisition kept during Galileo. You can actually find all four of his depositions online, um, and you can also find his official uh, statement of recant of uh, recanting, sort of official recanting statement. You can also find um, you can also find the trial transcripts. And ironically, I actually I Googled it and I came up with several websites who had all like put the trial documents of Galileo online, and they were all websites that were devoted to like how religion and science like don't go together. And I was thinking to myself, I'm reading the documents, and I'm saying, these people must not have, not, not have read the documents very closely. <laughs> because if you actually read the primary sources, it would actually seem to uh, go against the point. But, uh, so, Galileo, Galileo Galilei, he's uh, from Pisa in Italy, born in 1564, and uh, died in 1642, which is the same day that Isaac Newton was born. Um, the Galileo trial is interesting, mostly because it is the only trial on record of an academic by the Inquisition. So, it is the only, so as I mentioned earlier in the Inquisition talk, um, according to the, the uh, Fourth Lateran Council, the Inquisition, the, they imposed regulations on the Inquisition, and one of the regulations was the Inquisition was not allowed to operate in schools or universities, was not allowed to put academics on trial um, as a general rule. And, there were, and, and they had a mechanism for how you could get an exception to that rule, but as a general rule, Inquisition was not allowed to put scholars on trial. Um, and what's interesting is that the Galileo case is the only 
such trial that has a written record. So if the Inquisition put other people on record, there is no way of knowing if they did or didn't because there's no written record of it. Um, the, only the only trial of an academic that actually has documents that you can go back and look at is the trial of Galileo. So, um, let's see. So it's the only trial on the historical record of an academic by the Inquisition. Was, was he a, from a family, a non-fortunate family? In other words, was his family a family of wealth? Um, because generally back in uh, that time, the only people that would be people mm -hmm. of education yeah. was families of wealth. Mm -hmm. If you were a peasant, you don't get educated. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look at that because I don't recall him being from a particularly, uh, in other words, I, I know, like, I, I'm familiar with, like, the major noble families throughout Italy. I don't think he was from one of the major noble families. If he was from, I want to say he was, like, he was, like, from what we think of the middle class, like, from some place like that. He was a merchant son, something like that. Someone who would have had access to be able to read and write and get educated, but he certainly wasn't from one of the noble families, as I recall. Um, we have to go back and check that, but as I recall, he's not going to go down. Um, and the trial, I believe, the trial was in 1615. So the, the background for this is the uh, is sort of the, the heliocentric versus geocentric universe debate that took place in the 15 and early 1600s. So heliocentric versus geocentric. And one of the issues here is that uh, Copernicus, who, so Copernicus, uh, who died in, so death in 1543, had posited a heliocentric universe, right? He had done, he had, he had made a theory saying that the, the universe, or the, uh, the universe is actually heliocentric, that, you know, the Earth revolves around the sun and stuff like that. And... At the time of his death, uh, this writing was endorsed, this, uh, his uh, paper saying this was endorsed by Pope Paul III. So the Copernican heliocentric universe was endorsed by Pope Paul III. And Pope Paul III was the same uh, Pope Paul that officially issued the papal bull saying that Indians were not allowed to be enslaved in the New World, that's Spanish. Um, so and see how well, how well they listen to that one. But this so heliocentric universe was endorsed by Pope Paul III and met no condemnation by any of the popes between Pope Paul III and the Trial of Galileo. So the Trial of Galileo is in 1615. Copernicus publishes the heliocentric universe sort of in the last couple of years of his life. Uh, Pope Paul III in, reads the work, endorses it, and it meets no condemnation. Um, by any by any books between Pope Paul III and and uh, Urban VIII, who puts Galileo, who ends up with Galileo on trial. Ironically, um, the heliocentric universe was endorsed. Copernicus's theory was endorsed by Pope Paul III, but it was condemned by both Luther and Calvin. So Luther and Calvin both condemned Copernicus's work as, as heretical, but Pope Paul III endorsed it as. Um, the most up-to-date, most likely to be accurate theory, which should be taught in every university. So this means that by the time of Galileo, in, by the time of Galileo, by the time Galileo comes along, he's born in 1564. Copernicus, Copernican theory has been has been taught by the time it was taught in every university in Europe as the most up-to-date, most likely to be accurate theory for something like you know, 20 years. yeah, at least 20 years before he's born. You know, and then by the time he actually starts becoming a famous scientist, you know, you're talking almost 60 or 70 years. Yes? You said that, that Calvin, I mean, Luther... Luther and Calvin both, both endorsed that theory. Did they go on the record? Of no, they, they, they both issued statements to their followers saying Copernican theory was, like, anti-scriptural and the work of the devil and stuff like this. But this is priest led um, they, they, well, 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 well uh, Luther, Luther nails his theses, his 95 theses, in 1517. 17. 1517. 17. Okay. So, 
Yeah. Copernicus publishes his theory in the early 1540s before he dies. Um, and so we're talking, you know, 30 years after Copernicus. The Council of Trent starts in the late 1540s. Uh, and the Council of Trent ends in the 1560s. So the evangelicals are flat world people. <laughs> they were. <laughs> Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to address that as the rest of the part of the talk here. Uh, but I don't want to go off of that tangent. But, but yeah, what's interesting here is that Pope Paul III right away endorses Copernican theory and gives it a nihil obstat and an imprimatur and says that it can't, or it gives it a nihil obstat. Later popes would give it an imprimatur to be taught in, in Catholic universities. I should say in all universities because at this time the only universities in existence are Catholic universities. So every university in Europe has been, had been teaching this by the time of Galileo as the most up-to-date, most likely to be accurate theory, um, and it was sort of the consensus of a wide variety of, of scientists teaching in universities. So, um, the theory is widely accepted at, univers at every university in Europe by the time Galileo comes on the scene. Um, okay. Now, this was, now, this gets into university academic ethics at the time. So, one of the things that's interesting here is that because, and it's still true today at Catholic universities, um, academics were not allowed in the, in Catholic universities in the 15 and 1600s to teach things that were not true. So, if you were teaching something that could not be proved, if you were teaching something that, that uh, was not proven, you had to either preface it in your teaching as, this is my personal opinion, this is not true, or this is a theory, and then you have, and then you are required under canon law for governing universities to present the other theories that may oppose this particular theory. All right. So Galileo at this, so Galileo, so Galileo is teaching in this particular context, right? If you are teaching at a Catholic university in the 15 and 1600s, you're not allowed to teach something that is not true unless you've explicitly said in your writings and in your teaching that it is your personal opinion or this is a theory. And if you say it's a theory, you then have to lay out the other other viewpoints on it. So. Um, if an academic was found to be teaching something that was untrue, so not factual, or teaching something, or trying to pass off his opinion as a fact, the normal method of solving this problem was the Pope would get on the horn and call the university and say, it's come to my attention that your professor of whatever topic is teaching something that is not factually true and cannot be substantiated, Please do something at your university. So the normal, the normative method of punishment for a, for an academic that was teaching something that was not demonstrably true was to call the university, and the university would punish the person accordingly. The normative punishment was to continue to allow the academic in question to teach, but not to publish any more books. So that was the normative response when an academic was found to be teaching something as fact that was not demonstrably true. So that's sort of the context of university at this time, right? That was sort of taken for granted. Universities are supposed to teach things that are true in their disciplines. If they're not teaching something that's true, you know, they're supposed to do something that's true, and as a result, that's like a punishable offense for an academic to be teaching something that's not demonstrably true. The normative punishment would be to ask them to either recant their teachings, and if they were not recant, they were usually asked by the university to stop publishing, although they could still teach. So what are the basic issues of the Galileo issue? Number one, Galileo uh, was openly teaching at his university and had written and in all of his like scientific writings, which were, you know, one, had received wide acceptance. Um, he openly taught that Copernicus, that, Cop that the Copernican theory was the only theory that was correct. No other theories were accurate. He, had, he said that he had proven that Copernican theory was definitively correct based on his experiments on, on you know, the uh, dropping of spheres, um, on the mass of spheres, as well as on his, um, <coughs> his telescopic and astronomical observations. And he wrote this in, in, his, in, his, uh, in his scientific treatises that were published and gained wide acceptance. In his treatises, in particular, there was one that he wrote 
around 15, or 1615, um, where he insisted that because he had proven that Copernican theory was true beyond a shadow of a doubt, um, scriptural interpretation had to change to, and church doctrine had to accept and take into account his scientific experiments. Oh. Okay. So we, we see a problem going to, going to be coming up here. Right? So Galileo had done some experiments with, involving physics, and he had also made, with his telescope, he had made observations about the heavens, and he said that his data set proved that Copernicus theory was true, that the church should get on board with this, and that the church needed to officially say that alternative theories were no longer accurate because he had proven Copernican theory to be correct. So, um, what was interesting here is that Galileo's scientific experiments were funded at the time by Cardinal Barberini. So Galileo was essentially, he was um, essentially the personal astronomer, if you will. He was on, he was funded by Cardinal Barberini, who became Pope in his, Pope Urban VIII. Didn't the church, though, you said earlier, the church endorsed Copernican theory. Yes. So he's just agreeing with the church. Although the only thing he's saying is, now I've proven it scientifically, yes. so now you have to put it in your scriptures that it's scientific. Yes, he, he, yes. He, he said the church the church needed to needed to update its doctrine to to uh Beyond theory. To yeah, exactly. Did they update, they update the church doctrine to match up with his latest scientific findings. But, but does that also mean that they can no longer go and teach the geocentric anywhere in the Yes, no, so like if the church agrees with Galileo on this, right. that means that they have to condemn, that means they have to say, okay, right. Galileo has definitively proven Copernican theory, that would mean geocentric theory is not true, right. no one should teach yet geocentric theory anymore. Yes? Who else was teaching geocentric theory? That we'll look at that in a second. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so, so one of the things here is that he is, his experiments are, are funded by Cardinal Barberini, and the Barberinis, if you are familiar with church history, are at this time one of the dominant Italian Roman aristocratic <coughs> families. Cardinal Barberini, and Cardinal Barberini eventually becomes Pope Urban VIII, who is the Pope that is asked to put Galileo on trial before the Inquisition. <laughs> and he funded this. Yeah, he, he funded Galileo's experiments. Galileo was on his payroll when he was a cardinal. He was kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, wasn't he? Oh yeah, we'll see how he gets there. <laughs> okay, so, as a result of Galileo's studies, the Inquisition had read these, and they had summoned Galileo, and they had said, Galileo, we really, really like your latest data set. Your data set is very interesting. It seems to say lots of good things about Copernican theory. However, um, you know, won't you at least admit that, you know, this is a very good data set that doesn't definitively prove anything? Because after all, how would we know that the Earth revolves around the Sun unless you've shot up into outer space and, you know, seen the Earth revolve around the Sun? And so, so what did, what's interesting here is that the Inquisition warns him, and he said, and Galileo, we, there's a document that they asked Galileo to sign saying, yes, I pledge that I will, you know, continue to teach in accordance with, you know, the previous, with Pope Paul III's, you know, uh, document saying that, you know, Copernicus theory, Copernican theory is the most up-to-date, most likely to be accurate theory, but at the same time is, you know, not the only theory on it. So, he then goes back to his university and continues doing what he was doing. And his university is the University of Pisa. And the Inquisition gets on the horn to the this is the this is the Roman Inquisition now. This is the Inquisition that was the Inquisitors were directly appointed by the Pope. Okay, so they call the University of Pisa, and they say, University of Pisa, Galileo is not doing what he promised us he would do. Um, would you please, you know, sanction him accordingly? Now the interesting thing here is that the University of Pisa, um, they actually, and throughout most of Italy at this time there was actually a big conflict between scientists on this at this time. And this gets back to the heliocentric versus geocentric issue. Remember how I said during, well, last week, if you were here, I talked about the, one, of the, one of the things the Crusades did is they brought back the writings of who? Aristotle. Aristotle, yes. So, Arist so Aristotle at this time, 
was had only been in circulation for about had been re in circulation for you know uh, wide circulation among scientists you might say for you know maybe uh, two hundred years at this point. So, so the interesting so the thing here is that at the University of Pisa, the they had this big division between Copernican theory science science about Copernican theory, which is what Galileo was teaching, and Aristotelians. And Aristotle and Aristotle, in one of his books on physics, made a logical refutation of the theory of heliocentric universe, saying that obviously geocentric theory was the most logical theory to have. <laughs> so there, there had been a debate amongst ancient Greek philosophers as to whether or not the Earth revolved around the Sun and the Sun revolved around the Earth. And there were several Greek philosophers at the time who were saying, no, 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 obviously the Earth revolves around the Sun. And then Aristotle was like, well, we can't prove that. What we can say is the following. Ergo, based on the evidence we have, based on the evidence we have, it's more logical to assume that, you know, the, uh, the geocentric universe is the most likely to be accurate. Now the issue with, is Aristotle had, had Aristotle, the Aristotelian teachings had been recirculated in the West. And Aristotle appeared to be right about lots of things involving philosophy and moral ethics and you know, biology, and Aristotle seemed to be right about lots of things. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't we also consider what Aristotle has to say about the Earth revolving around the Sun? He seems to be right about bio biological things. He seems to be right about issues of moral philosophy. I mean, he seems to be right on lots of issues involving, you know, uh, how you can detect spiritual things. You know, he seems right about lot, lots of things. Why would we just chuck out Aristotle because Galileo Galilei at the University of Pisa and the Copernicans came up with this theory. So when the Inquisition calls the University of Pisa, the, uh, the Aristotelian, they interview people at the University of Pisa, and the Aristotelians say, say, we're not going to punish Galileo, um, because, I mean, after all, you know, we're divided at this university, so we really think um, we're not going to punish him. So, Inquisition, if you want anything done about Galileo, you're going to have to take it up yourself. So the University of Pisa passes the buck and says, we're not going to punish Galileo. You know, we have too much of an internal debate in this, amongst the scientists <laughs> at our university. Inquisition, you're going to have to take this up if you want anything done about it. So... How does this end up getting taken up by the Inquisition? After all, I mean, they're not allowed to be, you know, operating in universities and schools and everything like that. Two, two things. One, Galileo's theory, Galileo in his writings basically did everything he could short of pouring lighter fluid on Aristotelians to, like, get them upset. <laughs> so, so, the, so the Aristotelians, the Aristotelians lobby the Inquisition heavily to put Galileo on trial to like show the Copernican, like put the Copernicans in their place. You know, put Galileo on trial, he's the quintessential Copernican, you know, the Copernicans, you know, be put in their place, and then we can have a lively debate once again between the Aristotelians and the Copernicans, and it'll be great. The other issue is that the Barberini family was not particularly well liked. And the Inquisition was staffed, yes, by some Barberinis, but often by lots of other cardinals who came from other Italian families that had vendettas against the Barberinis. And thought the Barberinis were way too powerful, and were looking for ways to check the Barberinis. After all, the Barberini family is very powerful. The Barberinis have a pope in power. The Barberini popes, or the Barberini, Cardinal Barberini, as, or Cardinal Barberini as Urban VIII, had actually um, fought a series of wars against other Italian states. So he was not very well liked politically in the papal states at this time. And he had political enemies that were in the Inquisition that were all too happy to take up the case once the Aristotelians at the University of Pisa lobbied them to take up the case. So, they, but in order to do this, they need papal permission to take up the case. So, <laughs> so they go to Pope Urban VIII and they say, Pope Urban VIII, several credible scientists, as a matter of fact, many credible scientists who are Aristotelians, um, are claiming that Galileo is a heretic. 
Are you soft on heresy? Oh. So Pope Urban the Eighth is like, well, you know, I did fund Galileo, you know, but and uh, you know, I I gave imprimaturs to the scientific findings as a cardinal for all of his writings, um, but I can't be soft on heresy now, can I? So he gives the Inquisition permission for them to put him on trial. Okay. So. So, so that's sort of what was going on here. So, um, all right. So he's put on trial. He's convicted by the Inquisition. And let's see. I'm not going to explain. All right. So he is convicted of heresy. He is convicted of heresy by the Inquisition. But the conviction of heresy, what what they consider heresy, is often misunderstood. Um, Okay, so okay, so often people today will sort of say that Galileo they'll misunderstand the conviction of Galileo, saying the conviction of Galileo was a condemnation of Copernican theory. <coughs> because this, he's found guilty of heresy, and one of the reasons why he's found guilty of heresy is that, you know, he, the controversy surrounding the Aristotelians and the but if you read closely the documents, the Inquisition does not convict him of teaching the Copernican theory. The Inquisition, so he's, he's found guilty of heresy by the Inquisition. But they do go out of their way to say that um, his problem was, his problem is that he was openly insinuating and explicitly saying in his scientific writings that church doctrine must be based on the most accurate scientific theories. Church teaching should be based on scientific consensus, not based on the facts that are either physically demonstrated or logically the only thing it could be. So, one of the things we see here is that um, he's, he's found guilty on two counts. One, he's found guilty of saying that, uh, so, as our back to the Inquisition lecture, the Fourth Lateran Council defined what heresy was. Heresy was knowingly and willingly teaching something inaccurate about about the nature of God. So Galileo, as a faculty Catholic university, was knowingly and willingly teaching something inaccurate about the nature of God. Namely that the only way you can know things about God is through scientific consensus. Oh, well, that's so he does meet the Fourth Lateran Council's definition of heresy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wait, he's, he's guilty of heresy because just, yeah. okay. he's guilty of heresy because he's saying that church church teachings must be subject to scientific, <laughs> scientific consensus. Right. So notice here there are lots of things that scientists there like scientists have a consensus on today that aren't necessarily provable, but most scientists believe that they're accurate. So let me give you an example of this. Uh, string theory. String theory, okay, so, so for example, most scientists would say string theory is the most likely, most likely to be up-to-date theory, right? However, that being said, the church should not make doctrine based on what most scientists believe to be accurate at a particular time. The church should make doctrine based on things that have been proven exist in reality. It's like, when I was going to college, and they, they spoke of sciences as theories, and they're always theories, that, because they, for the most part, theories can be changed at some time. Uh -huh. Well, I should say that um, in, in, okay, this, um, Within like scholastic thought, the scholastics argued that something was to be no longer considered a theory and was to be considered fact if it meets one of two criteria. Either one, it is sensibly demonstrable, 
like, like I can I can see it, I can touch it, I can taste mm -hmm. it, I can sense it, I can perceive the answer to this question with my senses. Mm -hmm. Or if you can logically deduce that this this is the this would have to be true. It's like nothing else makes sense unless this thing is true. Like you can you can say that you've fully eliminated like all of the other possibilities. Ergo, even though I have sensible proof, this is this this conclusion here would have to be true. Right. So so what the church is sort of going off of here is that no church teachings should not be based on scientific consensus. It can be based. It should be based on like the church doctrine should adjust to new factual scientific discoveries, but it should not be, it should not change its doctrine based on scientific consensus or whatever the most up-to-date, most accurate theory is. Is that, did fact. they do that basically because if you think about it, mm -hmm. scientifically prove mm -hmm. that Jesus rose from the dead? For example, right? You can't do it. Yeah, like, like, like miracles by their definition, like, you can't prove cannot be proven with science. So therefore, yeah. the whole theory of Christianity, yeah. For all intents and purposes, would go away. Yeah. So, like, and uh, so, like, for example, with a miracle here, a miracle would be something. So, the church would define a miracle, say, as something for which it's something that you can perceive with your senses, but you can't like scientifically demonstrate it to have to like. You can't scientifically replicate it. You can't scientifically understand what would make it why why a given thing would happen the way it does. But nevertheless, you have sensory evidence that something happened, right? Mm -hmm. So if, Gal if Galileo's teaching is true, that means if Galileo is that means like miracles, miracles like you can't explain miracles. I right? think like miracles, according to, according to Galileo, the implication of what Galileo was saying is that miracles don't happen. Miracles don't exist. It negates faith. It, yes, it, it would say negates the the crux of say. Faith. Any type of yeah. faith. Yeah. yeah, any type of faith. So, like well, I guess in this of faith is right. St. Paul defines in the letter of Hebrews, he defines faith as substance hoped for from things not seen, which is, which is, uh, so faith then, according to scripture, is basically the acceptance of a logical proof. in absence of physical proof. Right. So St. Paul, so St. Paul would say, for example, the difference between faith and being gullible is that if you're gullible, you accept whatever somebody tells you. Whereas like if you have faith, you accept you accept something that makes sense, even though there isn't like sensory evidence for it. Right? So the implication of Galileo's scientific writings and the so Galileo does two in his writings, right? He one does like give his scientific findings, but when he gives his scientific findings, he also gives like a philosophical statement wrapped up in all of his scientific findings. So if Galileo if the implication of what Galileo is teaching in his writings are true, then that would basically mean that Galileo would say, no no no, we're no longer going to accept that something makes sense unless you can perceive it with your senses. Right, it, mm -hmm. right. Um, and not only that, not only get it with your senses, but often he would put this as acceptance of <clears throat> acceptance of like scientific consensus, <laughs> Except, acceptance of the opinions of lots of scientists. Well, you know, it's interesting in the, yeah. in, in, the in the events that are now when we uh, make a saint and they go uh, through, they they consider the the miracles. They do bring in all the scientists in to sit there yeah. and prove that it isn't. Okay. And when they find that they can't prove that it isn't, then they mm -hmm. accept it. Yep. Exactly. So the um, so that that's the one thing they find. The second thing they find them guilty of is the canon law problem of teaching teaching his theory as though it were fact and saying that nobody else should teach their theory. Right. So the second thing they find him guilty of is is the canon law is the, the violation of being a teacher. Right. The uh, is saying that 
teaching fact and not theory. So they, they, they find him guilty of teaching his theory as a fact and saying that nobody, nobody else should teach their theory because <coughs> his data set has proven everybody else to be inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And the church and the Inquisition says, mm -hmm. there is no way that we can verify if your data set definitively proves Copernican theory at this time. We may very well be able to do it in the future, but we can't do it right now. Ergo, Galileo, we cannot say that Copernican theory is definitively true at this time. Yes, it is the most likely, most light, it is the most up-to-date, most likely to be accurate theory. We will concede that. But, we can't say that, you know, this is the only way it can be at this point. Yes? So on the second point, that was like the exclusivity of his yes. statement. Yes, exactly. That it's mine and yep. nobody else. Yep. Yeah, so those are the two things they convict him of. He is convicted of heresy, but he's he's convicted of the, sci the, the scientific consensus things, and the scientific consensus, the church should make doctrine based on scientific consensus. And the second thing they convict him of is a violation, willingly and knowingly violating this papal directive that said that he could teach his theory as the most update theory, but he couldn't teach it to the exclusivity of other, of the other theories, which he did. So, they, so they, they convict him for, uh, you know, obstinately rejecting papal authority because of that. And they convict him for, uh, and they convict him of this, like, more doctrinal thing of saying that church doctrine should depend on scientific consensus at a given time. He was so. like a modern-day scientist. <coughs> Well, 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 for his, for his, so this this is one of the, one of the reasons why like lots of scientists if you take like a history of science course at a, at most universities today they'll say like Galileo was the first martyr of science well he wasn't so much the first martyr of science as the first well, one of the many people who was like well he wasn't even martyred like, he wasn't even, <laughs> I'll get into his punishment in a second but like you know he wasn't he was convicted on these two counts. For very, for like very good reason, and his scientific findings were not rejected. They actually, if you read the documents, it will say Galileo, you have a very good data set. <laughs> you have very good scientific findings. If only we could prove them today, but they can't. At one point, one of the inquisitors actually gets up, and they, and he actually, one of the inquisitors gets up, and if you read the trial, if you read the trial transcript, and says, and says Galileo, prove right now that the Earth orbits the Sun. He's like, look at my data set. He's like, okay, how do we know you didn't tamper with your data set? <laughs> you know? And he says, look through my telescope. And they're like, okay, fine. How do we know your telescope, you know, wasn't tampered with? Yeah, exactly. So they have this whole thing, and Galileo is just kind of like, you know, he sort of, look at my telescope. Well, how do you tell what tampered tamper with, right? There's, they actually attack him, the Inquisition of when they question him, they question him for like not having enough controls on his experiment. They they question him for you know not being objective enough over the course of his you know uh, course of his scientific findings, things like that. They don't actually say Copernican theory is wrong. No teach Copernican theory. As a matter of fact, after Galileo, Copernican theory was still the dominant theory afterwards. The Inquisition made no attempt to put any other Copernicans on trial after this. So. Yeah. That, that that being said, Lutherans and Calvinists did <laughs> in northern Germany and in Switzerland. Um, okay, so what was Galileo's punishment? After he's found guilty of heresy, the Inquisition um, the Inquisition um, let's see, the Inquisition uh, gave up their um, Normally, the Inquisition was allowed to like give a punishment after the tribunal had found somebody guilty. The Inquisition um, didn't actually give him any uh, punishment. What they did do is they said, "We'll let Pope Urban, we'll let Pope Urban VIII punish you." <laughs> <laughs> so Pope Urban VIII, right? So, so so they said, "Okay, well, the Inquisition's not giving you a punishment. We're going to let Pope Urban VIII determine. We're going to let Pope Urban VIII show everyone if he's really soft on heresy or not." Is the, Barber, is the Barberini family still funding him at this time? Um, at this point, after he was put on trial by the Inquisition, the Barberini, he was no longer doing experiments, so there's nothing left to fund. But Coming up to it, all the way up. All, 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 all the way up to it, the Barberini family 
And for, actually, as a matter of fact, Pope Urban VIII, even after he became Pope, still, so still, still was giving him stipends. Uh, and he only stopped giving them stipends when, the, when he was officially denounced to the Inquisition. Personally? Or was it because he was Pope and about charity, he doesn't have any that he belongs to the church? So in other words, the church... Uh -oh. Not that I can know things. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, I'm going to put it this way. Theoretically, the, um, yes. As a pope. Okay. Well, wow. he... It is true that he is... That Cardinal Barberini was uh, funding his stuff. That being said, um, he was... Cardinal Barberini... There's no evidence that Cardinal Barberini or Pope Urban VIII was using, like... Church funds. Church funds for this, and even if he was, and even if he was using church funds for it, there's nothing heretical about the church funding scientific experiments. The Vatican has scientists that do scientific experiments today. The church funds them, right? Well, um, they had to if all the universities were Catholic. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So here we have so Urban. So they they passed the buck and they want Urban the Eighth to, to punish him. And before Urban the Eighth uh, pronounces. Punishment. Uh, Galileo does recant before the Inquisition. Um, critics of the Church's handling of this will say, "Well, they forced him to repent. If they didn't repent, if he didn't recant, then they would have tortured him." There's no way of knowing that. Um, the personal writings of most of the inquisitors on the tribunal actually uh, actually seem to indicate that they wanted this out their door as soon as they possibly could. <coughs> Um, because the only reason they took up the case was because people lobbied them, and they had the political motivation of actually trying to embarrass Pope Urban VIII for political reasons. Three of the cardinals on the tribunal were actu actually recused themselves of offering sentence, including Cardinal Borgia. Mm. Remember, God, he's, you know, mm -hmm. Pope Alexander VI from the early 1400s, the Borgia from Spain, the Borgias had since settled in Rome 150 years later. Right, the Borgias are now the Cardinal Borgia recused himself because the Borgias had a vendetta against the Barberinis, and there were two other cardinals that also recused themselves from offering from like the trial, uh, from offering sentence um, and judgment on Galileo because of that. So it's a highly mo it's a, it is a highly politically motivated trial, to say the least. Um, but he does he does offer a, a recanting statement in his own hand. Uh, it's difficult to know how genuine it was, because after okay, after Pope Urban VIII gives him punishment, his punishment was um, house arrest at a papal villa, um, <laughs> where he could receive visitors but could not publish. Wow. So his Galileo's punishment is actually the punish the pretty much the same punishment he would have gotten had the University of Pisa given him the normative punishment in the first place. <laughs> rather than recommending him to the Inquisition. So Galileo then does, during this time, right, many people were going to Galileo, and Galileo was still allowed to teach in his papally funded papal villa. <laughs> Until he died in, 16, in, the 16, in 1642. So, at this point, uh, well, see, how old was he? So 1564 to uh, 1642. So. Yeah, so he, he, lived, he lives, you know, he lives above life expectancy by quite a bit for the time period. Um, you know, he's, you know, his meals were provided to him at papal expense. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, um, he, didn't, let's see. he didn't live so, in a hovel either, he lived in a nice place. Yeah, no, he lived, he lived, in, he lived in, one of the, in a papal summer residence, actually. Um, so people that went to visit Galileo afterwards, uh, their writings are kind of divided. Some people that went to visit Galileo say, yes, they truly believe that his recanting was genuine. Other people said, well, no, we don't believe his recanting was genuine. So there's no way to know whether his recanting was genuine for sure or not. He did recant. Um, he did abide by Pope Urban VIII's punishment. He never published again. He was allowed to teach, and he did continue to teach as he had been teaching before. Um, could he have been published through someone else? Um, published nobody seems nobody seems to think that he was published by somebody else. But I would imagine that you know, I'd imagine that. Yeah, I mean, maybe you know, if he if he was allowed to teach, that means like his students could publish his theory as long as 
they were aware of like what happened to Galileo and they were not willing to put in the philosophical conclusions. Because the Inquisition's problem wasn't that Galileo published his scientific conclusions. Their problem was that he published scientific conclusions and then like made a theory about what the church doctrine should be as a result of his data set. Um, so, ironically, very few people at the time seemed to think this was a big idea, a big deal. As a matter of fact, um, nobody, the first person, the first historians to write condemnatory of the church's handling of Galileo didn't occur until the 1800s. So, um, most people at the time, as a matter of fact, thought this was in, in call, <laughs> what we would call inside the beltway stuff, inside baseball. Most people, most people at the time sort of said, look, the trial is obviously politically motivated. You know, this is not representative of the church. You know, impl you know Gal after Galileo was tried, the church didn't change its substantive policies. There were no, you know, academics put on trial, you know, for the same reason. You know, things sort of kept on going as they had been. So very few people, there were almost no primary sources other than the Inquisitional documents themselves, Galileo's trial, um, suggesting that the church like did anything bad. Like no political commentators at the time. Cardinal Saint Robert Bellarmine actually wrote extensively on this, and he actually said that you know, under the circumstances, he, 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 he says under the circumstances, you know, given all of the political pressures at hand, he thought the church did remarkably well given all the political pressure that was brought to, brought to bear during this trial. And Cardinal Bellarmine actually, Cardinal Saint Robert, Saint Cardinal Robert Bellarmine actually wrote extensively saying that you know that's actually an unintended mission of how good the church is, even when they had all this political you know political inside baseball influencing the church, they still managed to you know do something right. So the real yeah. story behind Galileo is the politics, not the science. Yeah. So. If we're, so let's talk about how we could do apologetics for this. Number one thing, number one thing that you mentioned. Number one thing that I would point out when I talk to somebody about this is to say, look, he's the only he's the only academic who was put on trial by the Inquisition, and the only reason that he actually got to trial was because of political reasons, right? If he were Joe Schmo, who was not funded by Cardinal Barberini, he may not have gone to trial. The University of Pisa probably just would have said, fine, Galileo. Stop publishing, stop publishing these parts of your treatises. So there is a huge political game being played here with the Galileo trial. What else? So if we had to do, so what are some major things here that we could use to do apologetics? What are, someone brings up the Galileo trial. Obviously this shows, you know, the church doesn't know what it's talking about. The church is anti-science. Well, go, uh, yeah. the, the people, um, Acceptance of the heliocentric yeah. uh, thing for over uh, for nearly a hundred years before this event. Yeah, they yeah. had uh, published it and, and, and they said yes, this this makes sense. Yeah. So they weren't opposed to that that theory. Yeah, good, right? They were not opposed to Galileo's scientific findings. As a matter of fact, the basic theory that he was trying to prove had already been accepted for almost you know upwards of you know lots of years. So. 1540s, so that would be 60 years plus 10, so like 75 years before Galileo's put on trial. This has already been accepted with papal approval. Yeah, I, what else? I think the real thing is, is his condemnation of faith, mm -hmm. wanting to have everything as scientific proof, much like our global warming idiots do today. Okay. You know? Yeah, that's a good one because the, a lot of the uh, what you get from Evangelicals is, um, you know, do you have the faith, and do you believe in God, and, and so he's sitting there. Yeah. Well, one of the big issues here is that Galileo himself, if you read Galileo's writings, he never, he actually never thought that he was making an attack on faith. But it's kind of funny because, like, inquisitors, if you read the trial transcripts, the inquisitors are like, "Don't you see that this is an attack on faith?" And he's like, "No, don't see that's an attack on faith." And they're like, "Listen." <laughs> Listen to what you are saying. We will read back your words to you. And Galileo's like, no, I'm a good Catholic. I don't see. I don't see why this is, you know, contradicting the faith. <laughs> so, like, so, so, there are actually several cardinals who wrote in their own writings later about the Inquisition, about the Galileo trial, saying that Galileo's 
Galileo's real crime was that he was so thick-headed that they couldn't like reason with him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? he was right. I mean, yeah. Totally prideful and right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else, Richie? Well, yeah, yeah, like his char the charges on him were had nothing to do with his scientific. Yeah, good. So the thing is actually convict him of the heresy they convict him of is not his scientific teachings. It's mm -hmm. the implications of that came from from his you know, thick-headedness of. The implications that he thought were there from his theory, yes. But with the uh, Copernican theory, mm -hmm. everything revolves around the sun. Yes. Okay. Everybody accepts that today. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church accepts it. Yes, everything revolves around the sun. We're not denying that. Yes. So, basically, if you turn around saying, well, you guys put Galileo on trial because he accepted that, he theorized or he supported that everything revolves yep. around the sun. <coughs> That's what we all yeah. said. Yeah. That's not why we put him on trial. Yes, exactly, exactly right. Like, <laughs> you're great, great way to, all wrong yeah. here. Yeah, great way to do apologetic. Great way to do apologetics here, right? You know, well, obvious. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's a very, that's a very good point, right? Get Galileo's for the Helios perfect universe. What do you say about that? Yeah, so did we. We did it 70 years before Galileo did. Yeah, <laughs> and in opposition to, to Luther, and in opposition to two of the major Protestant leaders. Luther and Calvin. Yes. That leads me to my question. That the criticism that arose in the 1800s mm -hmm. was that coming from the Protestants? Well, that was actually coming from like Enlightenment scientists who were actually at the time you had like you start off in the late 1600s, early 1700s, with guys like Voltaire, for example, arguing that we needed to get rid of the church because the church had held back progress, for example, scientific progress, and that developed to the into the 1700s and 1800s where you had. Enlightenment scientists or Enlightenment philosophers and scientists trying to argue that old institutions held back progress and they were looking for ways to try to show that the church had held back progress of various kinds. So that's when we started that's when we started getting lots of treatises about the church being anti-science, and we put Galileo on trial, things like this. Start sort of the tail end of the Enlightenment in the late 17, early 1800s. But that's also the time when atheism mm -hmm. started growing, mm -hmm. simply because the church has pulled itself out significantly from the political set of a country, mm -hmm. and monarchs were running, democracies were running, and saying, yeah. you can think what you want. Yeah. Freedom of thought, so to speak, vice. Um, okay, you can think whatever you want, but remember your foundation is church doctrine, yeah. so to speak. I'm, I'm not sure it's so much freedom of thought. You could always have freedom of thought. You just had to prove it. Yeah. And I think one of the things that the Enlightenment guys were is they weren't wait, wanting to wait for real proof to spread across. Like, you know, you talk about, you know, the, the earth revolving around the sun. I mean, that whole thing coming into fact was an evolutionary thing that many people throughout the world finally got the data sets, got got the agreement and all that stuff. It wasn't like one spark. Yeah. Here it comes. Yeah, I, mean, I even point out, remember, remember, remember like the whole reason that Aristotle posits the Geocentric universe is that there's a debate in ancient Greece amongst Greek philosophers whether or not the Earth revolves around the sun or revolves around the Earth. So this obviously like wasn't a new thing. Yeah. It was simply it was simply that you know, uh, what you could argue, he was cocky. Uh, but the uh, uh, one of the major things we see here is that, um, as as you're saying, you know, quite correctly, is that um, sh surely, yes, yes, you can say that. Yes, the church was interested in making sure that academics taught only things that were true. And if they weren't teaching things that were true, they had to preface them by saying, "This is my opinion," or "This is my theory." Now I'm going to explain the other theories, right. which is no longer a restriction that university professors have in most universities. In Catholic universities, that's like still on paper that they have to do that, but <coughs> there's like nobody really left to go actually enforce that. Um, I mean, how many of doctrine they could if they wanted to, but you know, it's yeah. Is that like the mandate? What do you mean by the mandate? Of, of directing a Catholic university to yeah. teaching Catholic. Yes, yeah, like that. it's part. Of, it's, well, it's part of canon. It's part of a canon law, as I recall, that um, that Catholic educational universities are not allowed to teach things that uh, 
I think the actual article says something like, given that, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and Christians are supposed to value true ways of living and true things above things that are not true, you know, the, a Catholic educator or a Catholic academic, or they say academics in general, but specifically Catholic educators and academics, are required to teach things that are true, demonstrably true, and if they're not demonstrably true, then they are to be taught as competing theories or as the personal opinion of whoever's floating the idea. Um, but you're not allowed to like say that like this is the church's position or you know the church should agree with me or something like that. Um, so a place like Notre Dame would teach yeah. evolution uh -huh. as a theory. Yes. So so for example the church would have no problem with a biologist at Notre Dame saying, this is evolution, this is the most likely, this is the most up-to-date, most likely to be accurate theory, um, and then if there are other competing theories, making sure that they also talk about other competing theories. How, that being said, the church would say that, like, you know, the biologist, you know, should consider the possibility that God, that, like, God went poof and created the world, that being said, you know, that's not necessarily, that's not the most up-to-date, most likely to be accurate theory although it is a theory that should be considered, right? And surely there are like other theories other than the creationist theory and the evolutionary theory that can, they can talk about. But the church wouldn't have a problem with someone saying, this is a theory of evolution, this is the most likely, most likely up-to-date theory, one day we'll be able to definitively prove this, hopefully, and you know, until then, I'm keeping an open mind about other things. Yeah. Um, same thing would be true with like, according, according to this rationale, right in high school should be something similar. I'm pretty sure we do. Um, I don't know. I was in the biology class. <laughs> Ken, just um, yes. to, to mention evolution, like we talk week by week about yeah. what will be coming up, will we talk in the upcoming weeks about evolution? At yeah, we'll be so yeah the, the, one of the week upcoming weeks we're talking about evolution. Uh, we'll be talking particularly about um, um, the ins and outs. I'll have an article on it, actually. The um, ins and outs of sort of uh, pluses and minuses of Darwin's theory of evolution, Aristotle's theory of evolution, and then... Um, and then uh, the the uh, creationist theory of of, of existence. Okay. And um, in the world today, I'm I'm very confused about it. It's funny being a a, a public school raised child uh, from the Catholic Church. You know, I knew that God created us, but in school I knew we came from apes, and and my mom used to laugh about it. Uh, and you know, and yeah. she laughed about it. Yeah. A good a good document to read in the meantime is uh, the Pope Pius the Twelfth. Uh, encyclical on um, Humani Generis, where he actually addresses, he actually says to what extent, he defines to what extent Genesis chapters 1 and 2, the creation story, are meant to be literally understood, and to what extent they are uh, theologically to be understood, yeah, totally relative cool. to the three yeah. It's funny you say that you know, there was a show on just recently, mm -hmm. The History of the World. Now, let's look at things as a context here. Yeah. In the Bible it reads, God created the world in seven days. What, when you look at the word seven, it's used numerous times in the Bible. Yeah. Seven means a long time. It can mean that, yeah. A long time. So is it seven days or is it a well, long time? Like now let's look at the evolution. And let's say you looked at the Big Bang Theory. It's the first day. God created the, uh, the, mm -hmm. the, Earth, the, the moon, the stars, and everything. Well, that's a Big Bang, and that could have taken a million years. Mm -hmm. Then there was one piece in there that they turned around and they said, when apes learn to come out of the trees, mm -hmm. where the apple, where the snake, up in the tree, mm -hmm. the, and he comes out of the tree, uh -huh. takes the apple. So, I mean, you could put a spin on anything. I thought it was a very interesting show because you could put a spin yeah. on it that you could say the show really was about the book of Genesis. Yeah, I mean, and it's one, like yeah. a shorthand statement of the, the evolution. Yeah, of the I mean, one of the things we have to remember is that, like, when God writes scripture, right, he writes it through, through. He, Right? He doesn't, it's not like divine dictation, like, for example, a Muslim thing about the Quran. It's the, it's the idea that God is using the talents of the person that's writing to the utmost ability. So, the, so, like, so like, you know, if you've got an ancient, if you're inspiring an ancient Israelite, they're going to write down things different from the way we write down things today. Um, yeah, but I, I should say that, uh, yes, for example, I know at Christendom College, when they teach this, what they do is they sort of do... They talk about, you know, Darwin's theory of the ins and outs, Aristotelian theory and the creationist theory, and then they'll go through Genesis chapter 1 and they'll say, this is how you'd read it if we assume that this theory is the most accurate, this is how you'd read it, this theory is the most accurate, this theory is the most accurate. One of the things they point out is that when God creates man, he creates man out of the dust, 
well, he's creating them out of already matter that already is in existence. So you could read, you could read, so either on one of the evolutionary theories by saying, look, it creates man out of things stuff that already exists. You know, um, the word day in Hebrew, the Hebrews didn't know that, you know, the earth revolves around the sun. They, so, so how could they know if day is 24 hours or not? As a matter of fact, dating in, in most ancient civilizations was relative to events that happened in one's life. So it could be, for example, Greeks didn't do things and used things in Olympiads. You know, um, when was the next, when was the last Olympics? You know, and they would date things that way. Um, which is a relative time period, so they couldn't always agree on when they had Olympics. So, okay. So uh, next, so before I'll take any other questions, but I just want to point out next week we'll be doing table infallibility part one. Um, so in the Catholic Survival Guide, I think that's the first several chapters. What is that in the Catholic Survival Guide? Um, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, the very first few sections. It's the uh, numbers one through four. And what we'll start with next week is, I'll start off, I'll sort of go backwards with it. I'll start off with the actual definition that canon law uses for papal infallibility, and I'll try to explain how one, how, like the philosophical background of the doctrine, and then I'll go to like scripture that would seem to indicate that there's uh, that there is a infallible teaching authority of the church, and then the following week for papal infallibility part two, we'll go to church fathers, and we'll sort of trace the evolution of the doctrine until its official definition in Vatican I. So that's, that's the point. Okay, now, any, so I think uh, everything's getting out now, but I'll, I'll, I'd be happy to take any questions from anybody.